Acts chapter 13 is where we're going to be at this morning. We're going to look at the first 12 verses of Acts chapter 13. Well, you have seen the family photo, the new family photo there. Um, So this is my wife, Anna. Anna and I have been married for almost 12 years. We'll celebrate 12 years uh, at the end of June. Uh, Mackenzie is over on the left. She's our oldest. She's 10 and a half. Uh, Lainey is eight and a half, right? We got to make sure we get the halves. Um, she'll be nine in August. Levi uh, just turned six last month, and then Knox is 10 weeks old. Uh, Knox is adopted, in case you didn't notice. People tell me he's super cute, and I tell them that he gets it from me. You can, you can see the re- resemblance, right? Um, yeah, it was a long journey. We started the adoption journey almost three years ago. Uh, we did have to push pause when we transitioned from Illinois to Iowa. You have to update your home study. You have to do all kinds of stuff. Uh, but we trusted that God knew what he was doing. Um, we had a failed adoption uh, in November that we had walked with uh, a birth mom for in her entire pregnancy. Um, and she decided that she did not want to place the child. Um, and so we were heartbroken. We had no idea what God had in store for us. But just a few weeks later, we got a phone call about this little dude. Uh, that was going to be born. So he was born December 26. We got to bring him home from Alabama. Um, so that's our family. Um, we are serving in a- Adel, Iowa. Uh, we planted Restoration Church uh, in September. So we're almost seven months old. Um, and right now it is 1033. And they are gathering uh, at the high school in Adel. So if it's okay with you guys, I'd like to pray for them um, as they're gathering this morning, right? Father God, we come to you, um, God, knowing that you're good, Lord, knowing that you're gracious towards us. And so, God, as we gather here in this place in Casey, Illinois, as a a small gathering of the Big C Church, God, we want to pray for Restoration Church, another small gathering of the Big C Church that's gathering eight hours away in Adel, Iowa. Um, And so, God, I pray for our church family there. Um, I pray for Sean as he proclaims your word this morning. I pray for the team as they're leading, God, that they would lead well. They would lead from a place of understanding that there's nothing that they can do apart from you. So, God, we trust you in what you're going to do there. We trust you in what you're going to do here this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, Uh, Let's look at our text this morning, Acts chapter 13. Again, we're going to look at the first 12 verses. So if you would, uh, I'm told that it's custom that you guys stand here for the reading of God's word. So would you do that with me this morning? Acts chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. The word says this. Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So, being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist them. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. But Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him, in verse 10, and said, You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, full of all deceit and villainy, will you not stop making crooked the straight paths of the Lord? And now, behold... The hand of the Lord is upon you, and you will be blind and unable to see the sun for a time. Immediately mist and darkness fell upon him, and he went about seeking people to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed. 
when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you now asking for your help. God, asking for your help as you move in this place for us to rightly understand the scriptures. God, for us to understand first what you're communicating initially, but also for us to understand what you're communicating to us now, that we would rightly understand the text, that we would rightly live it out for your glory as we serve you where you've called us to be. God, we pray this in your name. Amen. You guys can be seated. Well, it is, it is custom for us uh, that when we preach, uh, when our teaching team at Restoration Church uh, works together, when we study together and we prepare to preach, that we write what we call a take-home truth. If there's one thing that you walk away from on a Sunday morning, we want to make sure that you have this one thing. It kind of summarizes everything that we're going. So I want to give you our take-home truth up front this morning, and it's this. There it is. The people of God are called out for God's glory to serve Him. The people of God are called out for God's glory to serve Him. So as Christ followers, we are uniquely called to serve Him. I I want you to hear that. That as Christ followers, we are called out by God to serve Him where He's called us to go. Now it would be really easy to look at this text this morning and say, wow, that means that Saul and Barnabas were called out. They had to serve God. Everybody else just got to hang out. Eric standing in front of me this morning. He's a North American missionary. He's a church planner. He's called out. We just get to hang out. That's not it at all. As Christ followers, as the people of God, we're all called out for God's glory to serve him where he's called us. So I want to direct you to the text. And we see three things this morning. The first is this, that the Holy Spirit calls us out. Look at verse 1. It says, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So there's multiple people that are gathered here. These are the prophets and teachers in the church at Antioch. In verse 2, Luke tells us this, he says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Now, I think it's important for us to note this here, that the Holy Spirit was speaking. We would all agree with that, right? The Holy Spirit speaks. But what's key in this text is that the church was worshiping and fasting, and because they were worshiping and fasting, when the Holy Spirit spoke, they heard. We have to be in tune with what God is doing. We have to be seeking the understanding that God gives. So what did the Holy Spirit say? He said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then, after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them out. So when we look at... This idea that the Holy Spirit calls, we we know that the context here is that they're in the church at Antioch. So what do we know about the church at Antioch thus far in the first 12 chapters of Acts? Because we've encountered the church at Antioch before, if you have started at the beginning of Acts and gotten to this point in chapter 13. Uh, Pastor Tony Morita uh, gives five characteristics to this particular church. He, he sums it up this way. He says, these are the five characteristics of this world-changing church, and it's this. That they effectively evangelize. That they're dynamic in discipleship. That they're active in mercy ministry. That they have a multicultural membership and leadership. And they're spirit-directed, church-sent and have supported missionaries. So this church, the church at Antioch, there's a movement that comes out of this church. And it's because of these things. And it's because they were worshiping and fasting. They were able to hear the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit told them to set apart for me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I have called them. So what does that mean? What does it mean for the Holy Spirit to say these two individuals need to be set apart? Does that mean that Saul and Barnabas are super Christians who get called out and they have something way greater to do than anybody else who's in that church? No. 
Because all of us who are following Christ Jesus have a general calling that we find in Matthew 28. You familiar with it? Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, All authority has been given to me on heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit, right? So you, you know it. That's the general calling of those who have been saved by the blood of Jesus and the power of the resurrection that we as Christ followers are called out in a general way to proclaim the gospel and make disciples of all nations. Do you agree with that? But there's also a special calling that God gives to specific people to do something specific. That's what's happening here with Saul and Barnabas. The Holy Spirit tells the church at Antioch to set them apart for the work to which I have called them. That doesn't mean that they're super Christians. That just means I have something very specific that I want them to do. Are you tracking with me? So when we look at these first three verses, I think we see a twofold thing that's happening. The Holy Spirit calls out. We know that. We agree with that. What there is transpiring in these three verses is that there's an individual calling and a corporate calling. You see, the individual calling, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul. Barnabas and Saul have an individual calling. More than the general calling. They have a special calling, right? So you think about it, and I sat in on a Sunday school class a little bit this morning, and it, the question was asked, how did God save you, right? Like, where were you at? What was your position? Who were you? What did it look like? Who did God use you to save you? That's the general calling, right? That God said, follow me through the blood of Jesus, right? That he's saved us. We have this general calling. But he also gives a special calling to us. And that looks different for everybody. Right? I remember my personal calling, my special calling, and, and it started with a guy that John mentioned this morning, the guy who was discipling me when I was in high school, who was a local youth pastor. I never attended his church, never attended his youth group. I was going to another church because I was chasing a girl, right? Bad idea, okay? But he, the Lord used that guy to disciple me. He discipled me and taught me how to read the scriptures. He taught me how to understand the scriptures. He taught me what it meant to follow Jesus. He invited me into his family and showed me what it looked like to serve your family for the goodness of God. And I'll never forget this. Now, students, you know this because you've been to Lake Salatiska, right? It's kind of a special place. Okay. Now, I, I think some things are different, okay? If you haven't been to Lake Salatiska during the Greater Wabash Baptist Association camp that your students participate in, you need to go visit, all right? That's my challenge to you this morning. You need to go visit. Now, I know that things are a little bit different now, okay, because I am older. But at the time, we were split into families. All the families were colors, and the last family that you got to was yellow. I don't wear yellow well, but I wore it. The last day that we were in camp, I was sitting in the last seat of the row right next to the aisle. And Brad Vineyard, who was preaching that week, was asked to come up and pray and close camp down. We were going to be sent out. And as he walked by me, he slapped me on the shoulder and he said, next year you're doing this. I said, you're crazy. Like, there's no way. I got bigger things to do. And that entire, the rest of the summer, I wrestled with, what is God calling me to do? I, like, okay, I get that I'm following Jesus. I get that I have this general calling to make disciples of all nations. But what does a special calling look like? Like, I don't know what that means. And I wrestled and I wrestled and I wrestled. And in August of 2005... I believed without a shadow of a doubt that the Lord was calling me to serve him full-time in ministry. I had no idea what that looked like. But here's what I will tell you, and we, we can talk more about this this evening. My special calling is this. To serve the Lord vocationally to fulfill the great commission and train and equip the saints for the work of the ministry. 
my special calling is not to serve in youth ministry, which I did for almost 13 years. My special calling was not to be a NAM church planter. My special calling was to train and equip the saints for the work of the ministry, which is the responsibility of pastors to do that. And so what he initially called me to in a general calling to fulfill the Great Commission, the same that he's called all of us to who are following Jesus, he compounded on top of that my special calling. There was an individual calling out of Saul and Barnabas to do something specific that the Holy Spirit had called them to. But there was also a corporate calling. You see, the Holy Spirit came to the church at Antioch. He was going to use the church at Antioch to affirm the calling that he had on Saul and Barnabas. It says in verse 3 that then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They laid hands on them and sent them off. The church didn't assess the situation and say, Saul and Barnabas, we think you're the best that we have. We don't want you to be any, here anymore. We want you to go. Because the reality is, is that if any of those individuals in the church of Antioch had been asked, do you want Saul and Barnabas to leave? What do you think the answer would have been? No. But the Holy Spirit said, set them apart for what I've called them to and you affirm them. He used the church to be a, a platform of sending. And we talk about this within the North American Mission Board. You are participating in the Armstrong Easter offering. But I want you to know this because this is a difficult statistic. In the Southern Baptist Convention, there are almost 48,000 churches. That's a large number, right? 48,000 churches across North America that are part of the Southern Baptist Convention. Did you know that only 6% of those churches are directly involved in church planting? And you say, well, that's crazy because we give to the cooperative program. We give to Annie Armstrong Easter offering, right? Yes, you do. And we're thankful for that. But here's what you need to understand because I think that this is a misunderstanding of our missions and what happens. You guys familiar with the Annie, Arm, or the Annie Armstrong and the Lottie Moon offering, right? You're familiar with Lottie Moon, right? Lottie Moon was the other crazy woman who Southern Baptists sent out to do missions, specifically in China, right? And at Christmas time, we give to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering to fund international missionaries. Did you know that international missionaries, through the gifts of the cooperative program and the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, are fully funded? They don't have to worry about salary. They don't have to worry about health care. They don't have to worry about housing. They don't have to worry about anything when they're on the mission field. And I love that, right? I love that. Our IMB missionaries are going to some of the deepest, darkest places around the world trying to be a light for the gospel in those dark places, and we love that. But did you know that it's not the same for North American missionaries? You see, North American missionaries... All of the funds that come in through the Annie Armstrong Easter offering go to North American missions. But that doesn't directly affect what happens for us individually. North American missionaries are partially funded for a short amount of time. Everything that we need above and beyond that is on us. We have to raise support. We have to find part-time jobs. We have to do the work of the ministry to figure out how we're going to support our family and fulfill the calling that God has on our lives. So when you give to the Andy Armstrong Easter offering, which your goal is $5,000, i am going to challenge you to give more than you've ever given before. When you give to the Andy Armstrong Easter offering, you are impacting hundreds of church planters and North American missionaries across the United States and Canada, and we desperately need that. Your gifts to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering provide monthly funding for my family. It provides care for me and my wife. It provides funds that help us as Restoration Church do what we do. The North American Mission Board, through the gifts of the cooperative program, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, helped us purchase everything that we own as a church. And it all fits in a trailer. Isn't that crazy? It all fits in the trailer. But, but... Only 6% of SPC churches are directly involved in church planting, which means that those churches know a church planter, are specifically partnering with him through prayer, giving, and going. Only 6%. And there is vast lostness 
across our nation that needs to be reached through church planting, through church revitalization, and you can be a part of that through a corporate calling out just as the Holy Spirit called out the church in Antioch. Isn't it interesting in verse 3 that the text says that then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. They were already worshiping and fasting, and now the Holy Spirit has spoken, and now they're going to fast and pray more, and they're going to affirm the calling that God has placed on these two individual lives by laying hands on them, affirming them, and sending them out. And as the Lord calls out, he sends us because the sent go to the people. Look at verses 4 and 5. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. When they arrived at Salamis, they proclaimed the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had John to assist. They were sent out by the Holy Spirit, but they were affirmed by the local church. And I want you to note this. They didn't go to a city and build a building and start programs and ask people to come to them. They went to where the people were. They went into the workplace. They went into the synagogues to, the text says, proclaim the word of God. Now, why? Why would they go into the synagogues? Now, now, pragmatically, that makes sense because the Jews are in the Jewish synagogue. The Jews know and understand and believe the Old Testament scriptures. What they don't believe, though, is that Jesus is the fulfillment of those scriptures, So they're missing the connection point, but they believe the scripture. So pragmatically, yes, it makes sense for Saul and Barnabas to go into the Jewish synagogues and begin proclaiming the word of God there. But I want you to see that they went to the people. They went to the people. Listen, this this is the culture that we live in, okay? Now, I I didn't grow up in church, and we we can talk more about that this evening if you would like to. I didn't grow up in church, so when I started attending church, I thought through things differently, right? But in 2020, in American culture, the church cannot compete with the culture. Do, Do you hear that? The church can't compete with the culture. There is never going to be able to be the musicians up here, the lights, the performance, or anything that's going to compete and overtake the culture. We have to be set apart. We have to be different. And the way that we're different is by not just sitting here saying, come to us, come to us, come to us. We have to go to them. We have to go to them. Now, that's a scary thing to think about, right? How do you go to them? Well, I think you have to do something that we call cultural exegesis. Cultural exegesis that you have to understand. You have to dig down. You have to do the research of understanding the dynamics of your culture and your city where you live. You have to exegete the culture. And then... As you're exegeting the culture, I think you need to ask these three questions that you can find in a book written by Matt Carter called For the City. You can ask these three questions. Are you a church that's in the city? Are you a church that's in the city? When the city of KZ looks at KZ Church, are you a church that's in the city? That you're physically located here, you're in the city. Secondly, You have to ask the question, are you a church of the city? Now, a church of the city looks exactly like the culture outside. And we know that we don't want that, right? We don't want what's happening inside here with the people of God to look exactly like the culture. We want it to be set apart and different. But the third question that you have to ask, and I think is where we need to get to, is are you for the city? Are you for the good of the city? Do you know and understand the cultural climate within your city? If I asked you the question, what is the unique need of your city, could you answer that? If I asked you, what what are the unique skills and resources that God has gathered collectively here in this body to meet that need, could you answer that? 
If I asked you the question, what unique thing energizes you? Could you answer that? You see, if we don't know the culture that's outside, I don't think the local church inside will effectively reach the culture. And you say, well, but the culture is scary. The culture chews us up and spits us out. The culture is hard. Well, how, how do I have conversations with people who don't even think the Bible is true? How, how do I have conversations with people who say that they're Christians but are yet living in blatant sin? How, how do I have conversations and live within our culture to reach those people? That's really hard and difficult. You know how you do it? The power of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit calls you out and sends you out to the people. You have two pastors who serve here at this church. The vast majority of you are not employees serving vocationally in this church. You all work somewhere else, right? Students, you go to school. You're around lost people all the time. Are you intentionally understanding your culture to have conversations with those individuals? What does that look like? Look at what Saul and Barnabas have dealt with. You see, because being called and sent out doesn't make us immune to persecution. The sent will encounter opposition. Saul and Barnabas did. Verse 6 says that when they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came upon a certain magician, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence, who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus the magician, for that is the meaning of his name, opposed them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Now, I want you to note that Bar-Jesus, the false prophet, and Elimus are the same individual. Elimus is his name. Bar-Jesus means of salvation. Isn't that interesting? That this Jewish false prophet, Bar-Jesus, of salvation, that Paul calls him a son of the devil. That's a little bit contradictive to what what he is known by, his name. But what I want us to see here is that the sent, those that God has called out and sent out, will encounter opposition. Opposition comes in many different forms. Many different forms. Spiritual warfare is real. Do you believe that? If you believe that spiritual warfare is real, then we need to live lives that reflect that. That when we walk out of these doors this morning, when we walk out of the doors of our house every single day as blood-bought followers of Jesus, that we're entering a war. And that means that we need to be ready to face opposition. But I think most of us as Christians, we want to isolate ourselves from the culture rather than insulate us. You see, we need to be protected from the culture. We need to choose not to participate in certain things. But we can't isolate ourselves and just wall up inside our house and inside our church buildings and say we're never going to reach the culture. We're going to wait for God to bring them to us. You see, opposition comes in many forms, and sometimes it's not necessarily the form that we thought it was going to be. Sometimes it comes from within. Sometimes it happens within our family. We believe that spiritual warfare is real, and and I'll tell you this story. This is how real spiritual warfare is for us. We have a family in our church, a family of six. We have four kids, and from Christmas... To the first Tuesday of February, in that span of about six weeks, they had had two days in their house where no one was sick. And I'm not talking about like, hey, my nose is running. I'm talking about their 18-month-old was in the ICU with RSV. I'm talking about mom came home from the hospital with pneumonia and strep. I'm talking about dad can't stand up and go to work because he's puking his guts up. 
And all they wanted to do was be in church on Sunday morning, serving with us and reaching their city. Spiritual warfare exists. Spiritual warfare keeps us from gathering with the people of God. It exists, and we know the one who overcomes it. His name is Jesus. His name is Jesus. Spiritual warfare exists. You encounter it every day, especially when you're seeking to serve the Lord. Now, what we know is that, yes, we will encounter opposition, but yes, there are people who want to hear the word. They want to hear the word. Verse 7, he was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, a man of intelligence who summoned Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. And in verse 12, the scripture records for us that the proconsul believed when he saw what had occurred, for he was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. Note, he was not enamored and astonished by the things that Saul and Barnabas said or did. He was astonished at the teaching of the Lord. He was astonished as the Holy Spirit was working inside of him and drawing him closer to the Lord. He was astonished by who God is and what he was doing. So yes, Saul and Barnabas were sent out. Yes, they encountered opposition, but... This individual's soul was at stake. And as a result of perseverance in the strength of the Lord, this individual believed and followed Jesus. So the Holy Spirit calls out. He calls out and sends people. And the sent people go to people. And yes, when those sent people go to other people, they encounter opposition. So the question that we have to ask ourselves is, now what? What do we do with that? If you are a blood-bought believer this morning in a relationship with Jesus, God is calling you out in a general way to proclaim the Word of God to all those that you come in contact with. So you ask the question, now what? What do I do? Well, I think there's three ways that we can respond to this. There's three uh, things that we can do. There's three questions that we can ask. The first is that we can ask the Lord. We can respond with the question, Lord, where are you sending me? Where should I go? As we were singing earlier and worshiping, I just, I, I thought of, of this concept that oftentimes, and, and I, I, like you, you can feel it, like he's getting ready to ask for money, right? Like we live our lives like this with our money, right? The reality is, is that yes, money fits into that fist, but I think most of us live our lives like this with everything that we have. But when I ask you that question, to respond with asking God the question, Lord, where are you sending me? I think we need to understand the concept that we need to live lives like this. With open hands saying, Lord, I want to be ready because when you say go, I want to say yes. And listen, you can get really personal with that. Because you can think about your kids, right? If you have kids in this room. Maybe they're still in your home. Maybe they're older kids. Maybe they're your grandkids, whatever. You can think about your kids and you can parent like this, right? These are my kids. They're not going anywhere. But we have to parent with open hands because what if God says, I want Mackenzie and Lainey to go to the deepest, darkest places in the jungle to serve me? I can't say no to that. Because if I say no to that, then that means that I believe that those people who God is sending them out to reach don't need the gospel, that their souls aren't on the line. We have to live our lives with open hands. Now, the second way that you can respond this morning, now I want you to hear this well, we can respond by waiting. 
And when I say waiting, I mean responding in disobedience, that you're waiting for God to bring the people to you. That you're not living on mission. We close our services every week by praying, reading scripture together, and saying you are sent to live on mission. And we believe that because the expectation for our covenant members at Restoration Church is that you regularly communicate the gospel everywhere you go and with every person that you come in contact with. So we can respond by just waiting this morning or... Maybe you already have the answer. You've asked the Lord before, Lord, where are you sending me? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to go to? You've asked that question before, and the Lord has been faithful to answer your question. And so you need to respond this morning by going. You need to go. What are you waiting for? Because you can sit around and wait and say, well, I don't know enough about the Scripture. I haven't been trained enough. Listen, you can't save anybody. I can't save anybody, which means that you can't mess it up either. The Lord is sovereign to save those who he's going to save, and he wants to use you as a follower of Jesus to communicate the truth of the gospel to them. And so we need to respond with going, right? And it's because of this take-home truth that the people of God are called out for God's glory. It's not so that people will pat us on the back. It's not so that people will remember our name. It's so that they will remember the name of Jesus because we're called out for God's glory to serve him where he's called us to go. Let's pray. Father God, we come to you, Lord, asking you, God, that we would respond in that way this morning. God, that those of us who are believers, those of us who have a relationship with Jesus, God, that we would respond in obedience to you, that we would respond, maybe some of us for the first time, we need to ask the question, God, where are you calling me? Where are you sending me? But maybe for some of us, we already have the answer and we're just hesitant to go. God, would you push us out this morning? God, would you send us out? to go in your name to the people that you've called us to reach with the gospel. God, help us to respond this morning in your name. Church, as we respond this morning, maybe some of us need to respond in a totally different way this morning. Maybe you have gathered here this morning. You're in this room this morning because somebody invited you to come with them. And you had no idea what you were walking into this morning. You had no idea that somebody was going to stand up here and talk about this man named Jesus. And so maybe you need to respond in a different way because this morning, for the first time in your life, you understand that sin is a real thing. And that sin is what separates you from a good and perfect God. And the only way to receive forgiveness of that sin is for blood to be shed. And that blood was shed by a man named Jesus. The Son of God, the Son of Man, the perfect sacrificial Lamb. That He went to the cross. He died in your place, taking the penalty for your sin, for my sin. And that this morning you need to respond in agreement with God that it is your sin that separates you from Him. That the only way to be made righteous in the sight of God is by following Jesus. And the scriptures tell us that you need to repent and believe. That you need to confess with your mouth, with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. That you need to believe in your heart that by, according to the scriptures, that he died on the cross, that he rose on the third day according to the scriptures. And you need to respond by following Jesus this morning. For others that are in the room, we need to respond with obedience living lives with open hands, asking God where he's sending us. And we need to go when he sends. Let's respond in the way that God calls us to.